Hey guys, what's up? Welcome back to another episode of Wide Open the Podcast. I am your host, Tony Gonzalez, and today's guest, uh, I had met you before. This is Chris Voss, Haas's negotiator, writer of the book, Never Split the Difference, Negotiate as if your life depends on it. Uh, a buddy of mine up in San Francisco, he's a big tech guy, and he calls me up one day and he knows I like to read and he's like, hey, uh, I got this book, man, but you can't tell anybody about this book. It's kind of a <laughs> secret kind of, weapon. Right? It's kind it's of a secret a, weapon. It's on the down low and, uh, you know, it'll help you with your relationships. It'll help you with business. Uh, and he mentioned your book and, and, uh, I, I got it, went out, got the book, read it. Amazing book. Thanks. Uh, but I think it might be too good, Chris, <laughs> because people are saying you don't want to spread this book around because you don't want people knowing the tactics that come in there when it comes to negotiations, it's a secret uh, weapon. which it's, it's a secret weapon, but everybody needs to know about it. I want to talk about you, uh, as we always do on wide open. I believe everybody's story on how they came up kind of tells why they are who they are now in life. And we were talking about before you, uh, the show started that you're from Iowa, small town, and Iowa. small town, Iowa, and you have four brothers and sisters, three sisters, four of us in total, Uh huh. four of us in total. Um, one older, two younger sisters. And growing up, kind of a big, that's a big family. But I mean, that, yeah. so negotiation, were you always a, a good negotiator? Is this something that, that you learned from childhood? No, I don't think so. I think, um, I think what I learned that's helped in negotiation was uh, really um, figure it out. You got to figure stuff out. Mm -hmm. Like my father was an entrepreneur and he just like, look, figure it out. Uh -huh. which was his attitude for his own business. You know, small business guy, you got a problem, you got to figure out how to solve it, you got to do it. So we'll figure it out attitude, you know, can do attitude. And then at some point in time, I really like being proactive, you know, getting out in front of problems. And an awful lot of the stuff in the book is, is really about how do you get in front of emotional problems before they happen, which is kind of a crazy idea, mm -hmm. but it's very proactive. So, you know, I think I was open to learning working hard and being proactive. Uh -huh. Now, did you go to school for this type of stuff? I mean, what, what, was, what, what were you into as a kid? Yeah, you know, I wanted to be a cop. I decided I wanted to be in law enforcement mm -hmm. uh, at about age 16. A buddy of mine and I both went and saw the same movie at the same time, The Super Cops, mm -hmm. about a couple of New York City cops who um, were wildly creative. Uh, I didn't realize it at the time, but uh, they were really good at disregarding what management wanted them to do. Uh -huh. <laughs> Uh -oh. <laughs> and uh, and the community loved them. They did a lot of good, a lot, a lot of good. They were creative, and the community loved them. And that, and that kind of blew me away. Both of us ended up becoming cops. The other guy, he wasn't really built for it because, you know, it's a, it can be harsh. Uh -huh. You know, you see some harsh stuff. And if you're, not, if you're not built to withstand that, you know, it's not for you. Uh -huh. But that's, that's what sent me in the direction of law enforcement. And did you go into law enforcement right when you got out of, uh, out of school? Graduated college. Uh-huh. Uh, Iowa State University, uh, got a business degree because while I was in school, I realized I might change my mind, so I, need, I figured get a degree that's flexible. But you know, I stayed on stayed on the track to become a police officer. And then I think you know, business degree, every everything's got to run business like, mm -hmm. even in the government, you got to understand business concepts. So I think that you know that helped me, helped me my whole life. Uh -huh. So when you decided to become a cop, did who was was there somebody influential in your life that kind of a mentor? Uh, that you could bounce Not ideas off, help you through this, or was it yeah, more that no. figure it out? Growing yeah, up you know, I just I just like the idea of uh, being really creative and doing something that 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 you know it may sound like a cliche, but it was I was doing good. I wanted to wanted to do good. Uh huh. Uh -huh. I want to have a good time at the same time. Uh huh. So nobody would, would was helping you, right? No, nah, there, no there wasn't. There wasn't really any law enforcement like influences. At oh, the I time. love it. Yeah. I love that's the thing about this show that I love because people are always like you got to get a mentor you got to get somebody that you look up to and and uh, it's not like that for everybody I mean and, and you still can have a successful life if you don't have anybody that well, that's here's, out there just you don't really need to be held by the hand. Uh, he, here's my opinion on the mentor hack because I get I get the mentor question a lot. Uh -huh. um, so there's a phrase, and the point is to get unofficial mentors. Mm -hmm. So there's a phrase out there that I really like, never take advice from anybody that you wouldn't trade places with. I got introduced to an FBI agent in, in Kansas City. I said, I want to be an FBI agent. Well, I was a cop there. I, what should I do? 
and he gave me some advice. Now, what happens when you take advice from somebody like that? They become your unofficial mentors, and they look out for you. Mm -hmm. And they're usually in a position to look out for you. And this guy was an agent in Kansas City, and he says, all right, so I'm going to tell you what you should do. And I'm usually on the interview panels, but because I've given you advice, I'm probably not going to be on your panel. And he laid out some stuff, some real basic stuff to me. It's something as stupid. I was so into being a cop at the time, I wasn't reading the newspapers. All I wanted to do was fight crime. Uh -huh. You know, and I, and I was thoroughly dedicated to it. But in the process, I'm, I'm not reading the paper. He says, you know, we're going to want you to be up on current events. He says, you read the paper? And I'm like, no. He said, well, you come into the panel, we're going to ask you, if you're not reading the paper, we're going to think you're not up on current events. Mm -hmm. So as it turns out, the guy's on my panel, and he's there to hold me accountable. Did I listen to what he said? Mm -hmm. Did I do it, or was did I just did I blow his advice? I had been reading the paper. Those people are almost always going to be in a position to check to see whether or not you followed the advice. The same way I became a hostage negotiator. Mm -hmm. I went to the person in charge. What do I do? I did it. The cool thing about taking that advice, nobody ever takes that advice. Uh -huh. Unless you're successful, you you know, if you're asking about mentors, you probably had mentors, uh -huh. and I'll bet money you listened to them. Yeah, yeah, that's the hard part, right? That's, that's the, the hard. Most too. And you did Don't what do. they told you to do. Yeah. When I went back to the woman that that actually was critical in me becoming a hostage negotiator, I put the story in the book. I could tell the story without putting her name in. I had to have her permission to use her name. Mm -hmm. I said, I said, Amy, I'm putting this in whether you like it or not because yeah. you did something really awesome for me. I just need to put your name in because I like to give credit. And she said, I told a thousand people to do what I told you to do. Yeah. And of those thousand, two of them did it. Yeah. So long story, take advice from people you, you should trade places with or you would and do it. Yeah. You know, actually do it. This guy says, read the paper, read the friggin' paper. Yeah. Because then, if I do that interview and I haven't read the paper, he writes me off. I get the lowest scores I could have gotten. Yeah. But since I had, I was actually embarrassed at the scores that I got on the interview panel. Uh -huh. So when that happens, though, you talk about listening. I think that is huge. Because I believe that the, the recipe for success, uh, it's, it's all around us, really. It yeah. is. I mean, you can go to a book. Like, I like to read books, and that's where I get a lot of my mentorship. But I also, too, I'll talk to someone like you. Like, during these interviews that, that I'm doing here, each, each week I get to talk to somebody who's done extraordinary things. I, I think it's a kind of a waste of time if I'm going to sit here and actually not apply what, what somebody's telling me, especially if they've been there. So I, I love that advice. But you, you're a cop first. Three years. Yeah. Three years, and then you say, hey, it's time to level up, and I want to go be an FBI agent now. Uh, and and then, exactly. Is that how like it happened? That, that, <laughs> was know, it that simple? <laughs> something falling out of the sky. All right, so uh, um, my father pays for a college degree, mm -hmm. and I go get a job that requires a high school diploma. Now, that ain't a bad job. Uh -huh. Being a police officer is a great job. But if I sent my kid to college – and then he didn't use that degree. I want my money back. <laughs> uh -huh. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. So he finally, he reconciles himself to the fact that I'm going to stay in law enforcement. He's got, uh, he, he's got a guy he knows a secret service agent. Now, at this point in time, I know, I know, I don't know one law enforcement, federal law enforcement agency from another, you know, they call it the federal alphabet. I don't know DEA from FBI, from uh -huh. CIA, from nothing. Yeah. So I talked to the secret service guy because my dad thinks, all right, so, you know, use your college degree, get a job that requires one. And the Secret Service guy says, I travel all over the world with Secret Service. Now, at that point in time, I think, you know, I grew up in Iowa. I think I'd probably seen Canada from a distance. Mm -hmm. I mean, traveling all over the world. I thought, somebody's going to pay my bills to travel all over the world. I'll do that. Yeah. Secret Service was not hiring. The FBI had me be putting on a big push. I thought, ah, you know, I don't know. What, what, what difference does it make? And I put in the application for the bureau, and I got in. Yeah. So it's you know again the path right yeah you don't yeah. know you don't know where the path's gonna go I know yeah, that's kind of the fun about it too at least I I, I I like that too you set your you set your goals but at the same time it, you never know what's could, what's gonna happen uh, right right uh, uh, I know you, you wanted to be a male model and, yeah. and you ended up a football player yeah, right? that's what it was <laughs> yeah. you know what I want I wanted to be a race car driver when I was a kid no <laughs> kidding believe huh? it or not yeah yeah growing up in Long Beach area uh, Long Beach Grand oh Prix, yeah right? Mario Andretti and all those yeah. guys I don't know. anyway. <laughs> Um, 
Uh, so so yeah, so so now you're in the FBI, and off of that though, Haas's negotiation. How did how did that come about? Because you go in the FBI, and I don't know it from Adam either. FBI, I thought it was you know from what I see in the movies, but right. there's a whole section of of Haas's negotiation. Well, you know, there's there's a number of sections, and actually, I was originally I was on a SWAT team. Okay. I had uh, I wanted to be SWAT. The one thing I thought about for most of my life was was SWAT, and you know I'm kind of a medium sized dude, right? You mm -hmm. know, um, which is, actually it's a really bad size because little guys want to kick your ass, and the big guys figure that you got to fight because you're medium sized, so you got to take everybody <laughs> on. It's a bad size. Um, so I studied martial. I started to study martial arts in college. And I ended up ripping up my knee. Have the have the knee put back together. Um, get on a SWAT team. Uh, every field division has a SWAT team and a negotiation team. Okay. And they do it as an additional duty in all the field divisions. And then there's always uh, people that run everything out of Quantico, you know, the mystical Quantico that's in all the TV shows. Mystical Quantico, what, uh, what is that? Quantico, mean? Virginia. Oh, is the, you know, okay. It's, I refer to it as, it's, it's actually, it's, it's one of the special places on a planet because people ch go there and change their lives. Uh -huh. Like you, you walk... You walk in a door, uh, just a, another person on the street. You go through the academy, you come out an FBI agent. That's that's uh -huh. a that's a transformation. Uh -huh. So um, I'm on I'm on a SWAT team in Pittsburgh. I get transferred to New York. I decide uh, the the bureau's terrorist SWAT team is a hostage rescue team. They're based out of Quantico. They're a tier one national asset counterterrorism. They're the equivalent of the SEALs, mm -hmm. which would make the SEALs mad to hear that, but it's in point of fact. <laughs> it's uh -huh. the truth. Uh -huh. I try out for HRT. I re-injure re my knee. I go to a doctor in New York to get it worked on. Um, he puts Humpty Dumpty back together again. Mm -hmm. But as you know, you can only hurt joints so many times. And so I decide, all right, so I don't know how many more knee surgeries I got in me, but I'm, it's like a cat. You're going to run out of lives. Yeah. I decided to become a hostage negotiator because they respond with the SWAT teams. Uh -huh. I could, it's talking. I could talk to people. How yeah. hard could it be? I mean, I literally remember thinking to myself, I could talk to terrorists. How hard could that be? <laughs> and uh, initially, I get rejected by the woman I was telling you about, and she gives me advice. I follow it. I get on the team. Uh, well, tell me about your, your first real negotiation where they're like, all right, Chris, you're up today. And so how do you get picked? And what was your first experience like? It, it, it's a straight initiative. Um, mm -hmm. I'm sitting in the New York office of the FBI, it's, and, and a buddy of mine comes up. I'm getting ready to do an interview, and this guy, Charlie Bodwin, good friend to this day, says, a bank robber in Brooklyn with hostages. Mm -hmm. Let's go. Initiative. Now, we're not called to go. We go. Uh -huh. and, and at the time, actually, uh, I'm... I'm nursing a bad right knee, Charlie's nursing a bad left knee. We drive up, we get too close, we're on the inner perimeter, we bail out of the car, we're low crawling to the command post. You know, between the two of us, we're like a three-legged race. We get, you know, four legs, but only two of them are any good. <laughs> yeah. And we get in there, FBI, NYPD puts the teams together. And, uh, you know, I'm, fr I'm fresh off my training. Uh, I, I got a great team leader. The uh, PD commander says, all right, we're gonna integrate the teams because uh, a bank robbery is going to be FBI and NYPD. And we, we all knew each other. We've been training together. And the lieutenant points to one of the PD guys. He says, you're going to be first off. And he points to me, and he says, you're going to be the coach. And we threw a team up around the guys. We start talking to the bad guys. Mm -hmm. And about five hours in, they decide to make a change. And, um, and the commander uh, pulls the first negotiator, and he points the finger at me. He says, you're up. This is what I want you to do. Mm. And How'd I, that feel? How'd that feel when like, they? Like I was ready. You 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 rise to your level of preparation. You don't you don't rise to the, actually you don't rise to the occasion. You fall to your level of preparation. Okay. And I was prepped. I had uh, the advice that I'd been given to to get on the negotiation team was to go volunteer on a suicide hotline. I'd steady been volunteering on a suicide hotline for about two years. I'd been to the training, when I went to the training and they're playing tapes of actual negotiations, I remember thinking to myself, I've been doing this for a year, there just hasn't been a SWAT team outside. Uh -huh. So I was prepped, I'd, I'd, I'd played in preseason, I did my practice, I attended you know, 
you want to perform in a championship, you, you do all the little things to get ready. Uh -huh. So I was prepped. They handed me the phone. You know, I, I leaned into my process. I had a I had a I had a bank robber out about ninety minutes later. You had him about ninety minutes later. Yeah. And during what was going on though, were you thinking about the outcome? Were you thinking, okay, what if I fail? This is my first time. What what was what was the, that like emotionally, or were you even thinking at all? Was it just business no, when, as usual? You, when, well, when you're ready for the process, I mean, you 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 just lean into the process. Uh -huh. Yeah. And and one of the key things when we're teaching people negotiation or anything else. You got to let go of the outcome. Okay. You just you just got to let go. I mean, it's like walking a tightrope. If somebody walking a tightrope is really focused on the end instead of the next step, yeah. they're going to fall off the tightrope. Yep. All you're going to do is focus on the next step. And so I'm just, I just leaned in. I just, you know, I, I did what I was told. You know, again, I'm coachable. You got to be coachable. Uh -huh. And then, then it's, it's, uh, it, it's a dynamic process with basic guidance and, you know, I mean, even on, I, I got clips of it. I get clips from that negotiation on our YouTube channel because. What, it's videotaped? It's, it's, uh, it was tape recorded. It's, is our negotiations all tape recorded? They should be. Every hostage negotiation should be. It's great evidence. Uh huh. You know, it's, it's some guy wants to claim, you know, whatever kind of nonsense. And, and actually, because we taped that, we convicted one of the bank robbers strictly on, the, on a spontaneous admission that I got from one of the bank robbers on the phone. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. And this bank robber, as it turned out, um, was did the exact same stuff that great CEOs do uh -huh. if they come to the table. If a really influential person in a negotiation comes to the table, and they act like they have no, they will act like they have no decision making authority. Like if if you're negotiating with somebody and you go, I don't know, you know, I got a board of directors, you know, I got all these people I'm answerable to. I'd love to give you commitment. Yeah. But all these people, I mean, I got I to go back to my team. I got to think what they say. You were talking to the man or the woman at that point in time. And this bank robber came on the phone and he's like, ah, you know, these, these other guys are dangerous. Mm -hmm. I don't know what they're going to do. I mean, I, I don't even want them to let them know that I'm talking to you on the phone. I got to whisper to you. Oh, here comes one of them now. And he put us on hold. Mm -hmm. He was the organizer. Uh huh. And the only way he can talk to us and not get backed into a corner is to claim that everybody else got the power. Yeah. Which is what a great, you know, the most influential person on the other side's team, if they come to the table and they have any brains at all, they're going to act helpless. You get somebody who comes to the table and is like, yeah, this is what I want. You know, they're in love with singular pronouns. Yeah. yeah. They got nothing. They are helpless on their side. It's the only time they get to talk about what they want is when they're talking to you. Uh -huh. When they go back to their team, their team goes, yeah, shut up and do what you're told. Uh -huh. And they get they get no influence. So if somebody acts really powerful at the table, that person is only a spokesperson. Uh -huh. And and this bank robber did the same thing. He's like, ah, these guys are dangerous. You know, I'm scared what they're gonna do. Uh -huh. You know, I'd let somebody go, but they're gonna get mad. All this nonsense. He was he was in complete control the whole time. Oh. Yeah. Uh, how many negotiations have you done? Um, including uh, my number is high. Uh -huh. All right, so. Um, I've, I've been, you know, ballparking about 150, 150 negotiations. hostage negotiations, including kidnappings. That number's probably low. You doing that many negotiations, I bet you've seen some, some crazy shit go down. What, what's the, like, what frustrates you what, what, when you know you're in for a, a good one? Well, I get, there's got to be negotiations where you're like, oh, this guy or, or girl, is, is she, she's not that smart. This is going to be, a, I, I got a feeling this is going to be an easy game, I guess, the way I would say. Like we're not playing against a very good team today, so. Well, or yeah, or you're not playing against a good team. I mean, most of the time, people on the other side of the table, internationally, kidnapping. Uh -huh. I mean, that's their business. That's their job. A Denzel Washington movie, Man on Fire. Yeah. Denzel Washington negotiates with the Voice uh -huh. in in Mexico. Yeah. Uh, and uh, that was that guy's job. You know, it's a, fi a fictional depiction. But the voice's job was to negotiate kidnappings. And wherever there's a kidnapping industry, they divide up the responsibilities and there's people specialize in negotiations. Uh -huh. You know, I'm working kidnappings in Baghdad. Yeah. And they say, ah, you know, this, uh, this guy named Ali, you know, and he's got the same cell phone. It keeps coming up and different kidnappings. I'm like, yeah. They go, 
uh, there's more than one Ali, right? And I go, no, 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 it's his mm. job. He negotiates kidnappings. Yeah. You know, people go out and they take, they take hostages, they find a negotiator, the negotiator brokers a deal for them. I mean, uh. it's, it's a business. Yeah. Uh, so when you go into these negotiations... By the way, uh -huh. you think Denzel Washington is ever going to see this? I, I hope so. All right, you know, <laughs> he keeps playing me in movies. He doesn't call. He doesn't write. Oh. I don't get a thank you note. You well, know, what was the other Man movie? on Fire, um, Inside Man, Inside Man with Spike Lee, great movie. And then actually, uh, when he did the siege with Bruce Willis, he came to the New York office, and he's a negotiator in the movie The Siege. And I get introduced to him by accident as as we're walking around. And of course. Upper management knows that if he finds out I'm running the negotiation team, that he's going to want to stop talking to them. He's going to want to spend time with me. So they, they you know, they got him away from me as quickly uh -huh. as they could. <laughs> Ridiculously gracious guy, though. When he came to the New York office of the FBI, I mean, very friendly. Everybody that walked up to him and asked for an autograph, he signed. I mean, ridiculously gracious guy. Uh -huh. What about the other movie? Uh with Kevin Spacey and uh, oh, uh, the negotiator uh, Samuel the Jackson. Negotiator Samuel Jackson. Kevin Spacey. Yeah, is that it's a good all movie. real? Is that, is that like you ever look at that stuff? I always look at football movies like any given Sunday, and you know, I'm like half of it. I'm like that's crap. That's not that's not how it is, you know. But they, some of it's real, but most of it is not. Is that how it is? When they you watch they did they did a lot right in that movie. Okay, I mean they you know they got to they got to you know they got to fictionalize it you know for dramatize it for. For Hollywood, mm -hmm. I would say close to 70, 70 75 percent right in that movie. A uh -huh. couple of key moments: negotiators are never in charge. You know, there's a there's a scene in that movie where Kevin Spacey says, "From now on, all decisions go through me." Yeah, no negotiator would ever say that. Uh -huh. That's the drama. Yeah, <laughs> that's a good line though. <laughs> a great line. Um, so when you're negotiating, though, are you telling the the bad guys? Are you telling them your name? Do you, do you get personal with them? Depends upon like a domestic siege, the stuff in in the negotiator. Yeah, mm -hmm. I'm gonna give my name absolutely. Uh huh. Yeah, I'm and gonna say hi. It's Chris. Do you get afraid though that maybe after this whole thing is over that they're gonna come back and, and look you up if something happens they go to jail or if you you know if you make them a promise that that ends up not being fall through on that your family or whatever it is nothing. You never scared. make that promise, huh? You never make that promise ever, ever. What promise? Uh, that well, you you can't keep. So what if it's something that's like out of your hands? You're like, hey, you know what? I'm, I'm sure money's involved too, right? Yeah, we, be smart enough not, not to make that promise. Um, I want okay, give me some principles. What's, what are you looking for when you're in the negotiation? When you, what's, what's the first thing you do the, uh, from the initial conversation? What are you saying to, to get things rolling? Um, and how are you emotionally during that process? What, what's, how, how does this whole thing work? Yeah, well, um, you know, we had a phrase What's it going to take to get the bad guy out? What's it going to take to make a deal? Mm -hmm. They're going to tell you if you let them. So I'm going to be deferential. I'm going to get you to drop your guard. Mm -hmm. I'm going to get you talking. And you're going to tell me what we need to make the deal. And because it came out of your mouth, you're going to want to make that deal. Mm -hmm. And all I, gotta, all I gotta do, all I gotta do, I mean, there's great power in deference. Mm -hmm ridiculous power and deference. Mm -hmm. So if I'm deferential, you're gonna feel powerful. You know, one, one of the secrets to gaining the upper hand in a negotiation is giving the other side the illusion of control. I'm not gonna back you into a corner. Mm -hmm. I'm, not gonna, I'm not gonna accuse you. We didn't know back then exactly how powerful the emotional buttons that we were pushing were. You know, we know now from brain science how you're wired. Mm -hmm. We just, we just, we were, we were taught how to sort of deactivate negative emotions. If I can deactivate negativity, you're gonna be drawn towards me. Mm -hmm. Your negativity is what causes your guard to be up. Your negativity stops you from collaborating. Your negativity stops me from having influence with you. If I can deactivate that, everything changes. Uh -huh. And you know, we thought it was hostage negotiation back then, but these days, now we have neuroscience, we have a number of other things. It's just human interaction. We were just applying emotional intelligence. Uh -huh. Just human interaction. It's so what what is that what does that consist of though? I mean, is it is it tone of voice? Is it rhythm? Is it what type of questions are you asking? I'm looking for those type of what are those tips? Those Yeah, little... well, it starts with tone. Uh-huh. Uh, because with tone of voice, I'm actually like right now 
before you can process what I'm saying, my tone is hitting your mirror neurons. Mm -hmm. And if it hits your mirror neurons, then it actually starts a chemical change in your brain. I can begin to change the way your brain functions just with my tone of voice. Mm -hmm. Neuroscience backs that up. I can slow your brain down with my tone of voice. Or if I smile at you, mm -hmm. it hits your mirror neurons, it causes another chemical change, it picks your, it picks your brain up. And so when you're up on a stage, what are, what are some other key takeaways that you've learned in this 24 years of experience, hostile negotiation? What, what are some other things that, that, that people can apply? You know, uh, let the other side go first. Uh -huh. I mean, two people sit down. If, we're sit, if you knowingly sit with me, you've got something you want to say. You would never have sat down if you didn't. Mm-hmm. You just want to know if I'm going to listen. Now, what you've got most of the time is two people dying to have their say, mm -hmm. which means basically they're talking over each other or you talk while I don't listen and then I'll talk while you don't listen because you're thinking of what you want to say next. Yeah. Let the other side go first. It's, I, I, I need that information. I need what's on your mind. You, you may suggest an idea that I already had. And the real secret to a negotiation is, you know, I want to, it's the art of letting the other side have your way. <laughs> uh -huh. So how do I do that? I got to get you talking. And, and, you, and you, let's say you say four things to me. And one of them was something I already had in mind. I'll say, you know, that one idea you had, I love that idea. And, and you're, you're going to do it because it came out of your mouth. But you gave me four things. I picked out the one that I liked, and I congratulated you on it. Uh -huh. You're going to run with that. Yeah. You're not going to let that fail. Because in your world, it was your idea. Yeah. You brought it to the table. Yeah. And, you know, that's, that's the, the whole bit about, you know, deference, gathering information. Uh -huh. You know, I need you to be vested. Another thing that I loved about the book, um, as far as tech, you just reminded me of it. Is, is I was thinking about my mom, <laughs> my mama. <laughs> when, when we were younger, she was the best when things got heated and angry. It's like the more excited we got, the, the calmer she got. Yeah. And the more in control she got. Um, ah, exactly, that, right? Is yeah. that more, is that another technique? Because I remember, th that is a technique, right? And, yeah. And she would, she would be like, Anthony. And she'd call me by my first name. <laughs> <laughs> a lot of signal there. I need you to do this and calm down. This is the way it's going to be. Wow. And once that, like you said, that trigger, is that mirroring right there? Is that back to... Well, uh, you know, it's... Down? Yeah, the la it's, uh, it's hitting the mirror neurons, a late night FM DJ voice your mother was a natural at. Yeah. It actually hits your neurons and it causes a change in your brain. Uh -huh. You know, we know it now because the neuro... But that was the way we were taught to talk to terrorists and kidnappers. Start out with that kind of a tone of voice. Uh -huh. And they would calm down. We didn't know why it worked. We just knew it did. Yeah. So we said, all right, let's, let's do it. I mean, your, your, your mother's gut instincts. Your mother sounds like she got great emotional intelligence. <laughs> she does. Oh, yeah. You know, and it, you know it, actually, it, I, that's how it was on the football field, where as soon as guys would come up, people were like, hey, who's the biggest trash talker you ever had? And, you know, when things are out there getting crazy. And you would. You'd see guys fighting with each other. Getting, like, I was never that guy. Never. I always, is it more, the more excited you got or started talking trash to me, I would just get real kind of quiet. I'm like, okay. Okay. And it would just calm me down and it would make me play nice. better. Yeah. Because when I did get excited, that's when all of a sudden I wouldn't play. As good. Lost your focus, right? Lost my focus. Now I'm worried about this and this. It just helped me stay in control. So uh, I guess I can thank my mother for that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, another one that you said you uh, start with no instead yeah. of yes. What is, what is that all about? Oh, man. That's, that's another secret weapon. I mean, it's ridiculous. How, first of all, when people say no, they feel safe and protected. That's why people say no all the time. Uh huh. So stupid as it is, all right, change your questions. If I try to get you to say yes, I'm always going someplace, always. We've been taught that if somebody says, hey, uh, is it, uh, are we in California? Yes. You know, you're going to stop and say, what am I letting myself in for if I say yes? Where's yeah. this going? Yeah. It's always going someplace. It always is. Yeah. Now, it's not always uh, meant to be malicious. You know, maybe you're just trying to confirm that something is true. You know, if, uh, are we in Beverly Hills? Yeah. Your gut instinct is, where's this going? Yeah. Which means you're starting to push back already. As stupid as it is, we just change the yes questions to no questions. 
and you'd be shocked at what you'd be shocked at what people comfortably say no to. Uh-huh. I mean, shocked. I I teach. Uh, I got it when I'm still teaching at USC. Kid in the MBA class. He's my my boss is. He wants me to corral this client. I, how do I negotiate with the client? I said, Nah, it's your negotiations with your boss. That's where you start. Mm-hmm. Now he knows he's giving you a tough task that you might be in over your head for. You got to go back to your boss and say, Do you want me to fail? Mm. And he's like, I can't do that. He's going to blow up. It's going to be crazy. I got to look. The no makes people feel safe and protected. It doesn't matter what the no is. Uh-huh. That's what's going to happen. He sends me an email that night. He says, I'm, I'm astonished at the result. Uh-huh. He'd actually been given the most difficult client they had because his boss was frustrated and basically want to put his best guy on it. He thinks he's being set up f- to fail. In point of fact, they're grooming him for promotion. Yeah. He feels he's been walked into a trap. When he asks his boss, he says, do you want me to fail? The boss says, no, 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 no. As a matter of fact, we're thinking about promoting you, uh-huh. which blows his brains because he thinks he's being set up to be fired. Yeah. But then the mere act of saying no, his boss goes, eh, yeah, I really had put you in a tough spot here. Uh-huh. So, and he, then they came up with a completely new strategy. Mm-hmm. So it's, it's, it's insane. It's utterly insane what people will comfortably say no to. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I love that. <laughs> uh, empathy versus sympathy. Yeah, that was another one. What? Uh, what Empathy's not what sympathy. You, you know, empathy in in today's vernacular, empathy's become sympathy. It's 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 really kind of screwed us up, um, in such bad ways. Because if empathy is sympathy, then you're not supposed to have empathy for other people. Ellen's got a video out there. She's hanging out with George Bush. Mm-hmm. Ridiculous amount of criticism of her on the side. Yeah. On from her from her camp. Yeah. From the liberal side. How dare you? Ellen's smart enough to know like I, we got to have understanding with everybody. So empathy is just understanding. Now it's usually on the way to being sympathetic. But I can have complete empathy with you and have no compassion and no sympathy. It's just understanding where the other side's coming from. It's a hostage negotiator. How am I going to have empathy, sympathy for a guy from Al Qaeda? Yeah, but that's my job. Okay. No matter how bad the person is on the other side of the table, I got to be able to develop a working relationship where I can get my way. Uh huh. Empathy is the fastest route if you divorce it from sympathy or compassion. Mm-hmm. It's a compassionate thing to do, but I use it because it works. Uh huh. I like it because it is a compassionate thing to do. Yeah but I use it because it works. And you can't fake that either, right? Well, you don't have to fake understanding. Uh-huh. You know, like, here's where you're coming from. Um, how do you negotiate with, with your loved ones, um, with, with your partner, with, uh, with your kids? Like, what's, what's some tactics that people can use for their, for their kids? Let's start with that one. I got four kids, uh, 18, d- d- uh, 11, nine, and four. So it's different ranges, I guess, of mentality. Or does it even matter? It's, it's, what's some tactics I could use for my children? Yeah, you know, well, negotiation, real, great negotiation is really about helping the other side think. Mm-hmm. I mean, you, your job as a parent is also to help your kids think. You what if they're to, not thinking? you, you got to make them think. <laughs> yeah, you know, yeah. Uh, you know that, your, your kid comes up to you and say, asks you something really ridiculous. Uh-huh. What you're going to say, it's not as important as how they answer, it's how it impacts them. Like your kid, you, your kid wants, you know, kid, hey, dad, let me take the car. Mm-hmm. And they don't even have a driver's license. Yeah. Or whatever, right? How am I supposed to do that? Uh-huh. Well, dad, let me take the car. It's not what their answer is. It's what the thought process you made them go through to give you an answer that changes the dynamic. Uh-huh. When you say, how am I supposed to do that? And, and, and in a tone of voice where like, you, you really want to know? Yeah. As opposed to, how am I supposed to do that, you stupid little kid? Yeah. How am I supposed to do that? Yeah. You make them think. Plus, actually, it wears them out. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Part of your job, you know, and you, your kids wear you out, you can wear them out right back. Uh-huh. Uh, so what about what a kid says, uh, a big common one around the old Gonzalez household is, uh, I don't want to go to bed on, at whatever. It's time to go to bed. 
eight thirty at night. I don't want to go to bed. How do you get them to to go to bed? What's something <laughs> they want that's coming up over the next couple of days? Okay, so whatever we're going to the park tomorrow, or whatever. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So you make what you want out of them the path to what they want. Like, how am I supposed to let? How are we supposed to go to the park tomorrow if you don't get a good night's sleep? Okay. They're like, oh. I increase my chances of getting what I want tomorrow based on what you laid out to me today. Uh So you've done two things with them. You started to wear them out. You made them think. You've started linking things together in their world. And you put yourself in a position where if they don't do, if they don't go to bed, they're putting what they want in jeopardy. Uh You know, it's the same thing we did with terrorists, kidnappers. Kidnapper says, give us us a million dollars or the hostage dies. And I say, how am I supposed to pay if I don't think I'm going to let them go? Uh-huh. Then I go like, oh, it's an interesting point. Because they want the money. The hostage is incidental uh-huh. to what they want the money. What about what when do they, I want? Okay, what about, well, don't worry about it. I'll let them, you have to trust me on this one. They never say that. But uh-huh. even if they did, they don't shoot it back in, immediately. Uh-huh. But all right, so like, uh, it's, you, you be the terrorist. Let's go. Okay, don't worry about it. Um, I'm going to, I'll, I'll, you have to trust me on this one. How am I supposed to trust you? Uh-huh. Because I'm a good guy. <laughs> How do I know that? Um, because of, I don't want to go religion. Okay, I'm going to use, insert religion because I'm this religion and I am a good person and you have to trust me. You're a good person and you're threatening to kill my friend? How does that work? Because my religion allows me to do that. Your religion allows you to do that. Well, how do I know your religion allows you to let him go? <laughs> now, right now, yeah, uh. what the really the point is not your answers as much as what I'm doing to you right now. Yeah. You're just I'm, keeping me thinking and you're keeping me you're keeping it open ended. Right. Right? Right. I'm and I'm not I'm not saying no. What about with the boss? Uh, I'm going there. The classic one I'm pretty sure is um uh I can't get a deadline in on time or I want more money. Right. Like wh- what about that? Let's start with that one. Uh, what what uh Which one? What do you recommend for okay, you give me something that it's impossible for me to 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 get this done by that time. You're asking too much of me. All right, so you know that. Uh-huh. But he's like, no, I'm not. You can do this, and you will do this. Otherwise, and and so th- and this is this is one you can imagine is going to cause your boss to burst into flames. Mm-hmm. But you're going to say you want me to fail. Yeah. Okay. You know because and because saying no is ridiculous. You know it makes people feel powerful. Mm-hmm. People feel protected. They p- feel safe. I mean, it's it's shocking what what people are will comfortably say no to. I mean, yeah. it's it's astonishing. Mm-hmm. And so I'm going to, I'm going to, and on top of that, and so you've given me an impossible task. If you've given me an impossible task by a deadline, all right, let's go through this a little bit. Um, it's important to you. Mm-hmm. You feel back, you as a boss, you feel backed into a corner. You're not stupid. And, and, you know, in, in point of fact, while we think bosses are stupid, they're not stupid. You know, I know I've given you something that's tough. So I'm going to say, seems like we're under a lot of pressure here. You know, it, it seems like, you know, there's some real consequences. I, I actually need to know what the consequences are if I don't meet this deadline. So from, and say, instead of me saying, what are the consequences if I don't do this? I'm going to say, it seems like there's some real consequences here if we don't get this done. Now I need to know whether or not there are external consequences or whether you need it done on Friday because you want to relax over the weekend and then you want to review it on Monday because it's coming up the following Friday and you've got all these ridiculous deadlines be built into your head. I need to know where, what those are. I need to get that out of you. And so it seems like there's some real consequences here if we don't mm-hmm. get this done. If there aren't consequences, and here, here's another insane thing, you'll tell me because you're correcting me. Mm-hmm. I mean, you'd be, the other thing that is shocking is what people are willing to say when they're correcting somebody else. I will get more information out of you that you would otherwise not tell me if you give it to me as a correction because as human beings, we love 
to correct other people. Mm -hmm. And it feels so good to correct that we'll blurt stuff out that we should never blurt out. Mm. So an intentional correction is a really powerful thing to do. Mm. Uh, like you work out, do you take supplements? Do you, how's your sleep habits, stuff like that? Uh, all the cliche good habits that you can think of, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, um, and we, we've had a couple of offline conversations about sauna recently. Uh -huh. Sauna's that new magic, dry sauna's a new magic pill. Dry saunas, and, and I'm hitting it hard regularly because uh -huh. you yeah. get you get an you get an aerobic workout where you're sitting still yeah. in the sauna. Uh, intermittent fasting, oh, limiting yeah. the carbs, good night's sleep. E even now, you know, uh, Rhonda Patrick recently got turned on to the time restricted eating. Yeah. So I'm being more careful about what hours. I mean, all the cliche stuff. I work out when I can. But you know it's it's the entire package. Mm -hmm. You know you you got you got to hit every. I intend to live for a very very long time. Uh huh. In good condition. So what kind of food do you eat? What you eat? What's your, what's your uh, guilty pleasure food? Uh, you know I um I'm still, I'm a steak guy. Uh huh. And I'm eating a. <laughs> I love my steak. Uh -huh. I, I eat a lot of steak. That's, That's the thing you would uh, pick, like you could, well, not, I, you not, know, not I don't, a sweet guy, not like uh, cupcakes or no, man. I'm away from that. Bars or something like that. And I'll knock <laughs> and I'll knock down occasional scotch or uh, uh -huh. you know a bourbon. Yeah, I, I'm yeah, having trouble that. giving that up. <laughs> <laughs> you got to try Modelo beer. Oh, they're pretty good too. Um, what uh, you know, this is one somebody came on this show and they were talking about family traditions and this is a question i want to start asking everybody because uh i think it's good like is there anything that you did when you were growing up or something you did with your family do you have any traditions like that that you could recommend that uh kind of make you better make you stronger make you happier anything like that yeah well you know i mean we uh, thanksgiving then was always a, was always a really big one you know any, uh -huh. any sort of holiday family meal after we run an event we always have a dinner the whole crew to get together we sort of celebrate it but my mom is there, and I'm like, Mom, you want to say grace? Uh -huh. And I didn't even ask the other guys how they felt about it. Uh -huh. I just, you know, just, just lay it out there. So, uh -huh. so, you know, there's a connectedness there. Oh, right? I love that. I love that. Are you a spiritual guy? I mean, you meditate? I consider like myself to be very spiritual, uh -huh. I, um, which is not always necessarily the same thing as religious. Yeah. Yeah, I consider myself to be very, very mm -hmm. spiritual. The, what, the rings are religious rings of different religions. Of different ways, so it's a, like a, a little mix of everything. Huh? You know, there's everybody's everybody's trying to figure it out, right? Yeah, yeah. I always say it's all going to the same place anyway. Yeah. <laughs> you, you can put a different name on it if you want. Yeah, uh, which is fine too. I love I love traditions and religions and all that stuff. It's it's good stuff. Um, movies. We talked about movies earlier. Uh, what's what's your favorite movie? And wow. Why? Um. Yeah. Well, you know, uh, Pulp Fiction's. One of my one of my oh, all time cool. favorites. I mean, uh, why Tar Tarantino, <laughs> Tarantino stuff? You know, every now and then, like he hits it out of the park. Uh huh. Uh, not every time. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah, there was some. There was something about you know the the Pulp Fiction, a great movie. Uh, both both the uh, uh, Sam Jackson, John Travolta characters in that. Not only will those did uh, um, Tarantino write great parts. Yeah. You know the guys hit it out of the park. You yeah. kind of need both. You, you, in in my view, you know the the, the writer, the director, whoever's in charge of the film, got to write a great part. Yeah. And they have to uh, the fates line up that they got the right guy or gal, and they interpret it in a way exactly the way they wanted it. Mm -hmm. You know, Sam Jackson character in that is a, is a phenomenal. Oh, one phenomenal of the best character, ever. right? One of the best ever. The way he talks and. Like, the path of a righteous man. Yeah. The <laughs> I've been saying this shit for years. I didn't know what it meant. Uh, what's uh, who's one person in your life that beat you in negotiation? Wow. Well, yeah. See, I don't look at win lose. No, okay, I mean, I, I look lose, at but who's somebody who, who get schooled you, me. Get you thinking? Get who you. schooled me? I get schooled by a lot of a lot of people at different points in time. Like uh, my old boss, Gary Nessner, who, who ran the unit, um, he's got a book out there called Stalling for Time. Like I learned so much from that guy. Even after he retired, every now and then I would call him on the phone and I'd say, eh, just, uh, your word's coming out of my mouth again. Uh -huh. Like, uh, he, you know, he taught us, and I said it a thousand times before, what I understood what it meant. He said, we don't guarantee success, we guarantee the best chance of success. Which now we, we tell people that we train in business. Like, I'm not going to guarantee you that you're going to make the deal. 
I'm going to give you the best shot at making the deal uh -huh. and making the best deal. That doesn't mean you're going to make it. Yeah. We're going to give you the best shot at it. We guarantee that. And, you know, Gary taught me a lot, you know, that fine line. Because the first time I worked the case where somebody got killed, I remember saying, and I've been saying for years, we don't guarantee success. It's just the best chance of success. I mean, by definition, somebody's going to get killed. Mm -hmm. And when, you know, when, when that train ran over me, which is really selfish for me to say that it ran over me because it wasn't a member of my family that got yeah. killed. Yeah. You know, it was somebody I was trying to help. It wasn't my blood. Um, I realized I'd kind of been prepping for that for a few years. Mm -hmm. How do you recover from something like that? You, you either you quit or you pick yourself up. Uh -huh. and, um, and, and I picked myself up. I, I was determined we had to get better. And consequently from learning that, I used, I used to go after negotiators who'd been in sieges where people had gotten killed who didn't quit. Because if somebody gets killed, you say to yourself, I got I to raise the level of my game. Mm. It wasn't enough last time. Yeah, and you want people to want to raise the level of their game. Yeah, it's got to be a tough side of, of what you do, but obviously it's a baseball it's bat to the it. head. But yep. uh, yeah, you know, you pick yourself up, you're done. Yeah. Uh, final question: What's one area of your life that you'd like to improve in that you're wide open to learning more about? Wow. Uh, um, organization. Mm -hmm. I'm a, I'm a lover of spontaneity. Mm -hmm which by definition is unorganized yeah. and adventure. Like um, if my motorcycle, if I jump on a bike, I got no idea where we're going, none. I'm gonna get on the motorcycle and find out. <laughs> uh -huh. But in business, I drive the people on my team crazy because I wanna ad lib everything and, and they wanna know where we're going <laughs> uh -huh. or how we're gonna get there. So getting better at, at, at organized activity is, is my struggle. Mm. Chris, thank you for being on Wide Open, buddy. I appreciate it. Pleasure, man. Thank you. Three, two, one.